produce the first seal. Is that clear? And so we said the Tartarian age produced the second seal. The Sadician and the Philadelphian church age produced the third seal. And then the Laodicean age produced the fourth seal. Is that clear? Huh? That's the way the ages produce the seal. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon produce first seal. Um, Tartarian age produce second seal. Sardisian and Philadelphian church age produce the third seal. And then the Laodicean church age produce the fourth seal. So, in our search, we now said, what about the other three seals? The fifth seal, the sixth one, and the fourth seal. And so we said that these other three seals, they came as the other four seals were being manifested. Does it make sense to you? Huh? So, I think we try to do something like this. Tartarian, second, the Sardis, Philadelphia produced third, Laodicea produced what? Fourth. Huh? And so we now said that The fifth seal came as the ages were producing this seal. So um, the fifth seal came along. The sixth one also came along. So I think from this chart we can see it. I don't know if it's clearly written here. Okay, it's not here. Maybe it's some other place, but... Um, like I tried to explain the last time, we said that during this age, wherein the Lord released the anointing of an ox in order for the bride to cushion the effect of the red horse rider. Because the red horse rider was to take peace from the earth. So he came to kill the people because of their stand for Jesus. And so we said that as the bride members were being slaughtered other persons were also being slaughtered because they refused to convert to Catholicism and we listed um, pagans that refused to become Catholics we also listed Jews that refused to become Catholics so the pagans you know God judged them according to their conscience so they preferred to remain in that um, covenant than to be converted into something that was very satanic, which is Catholicism. Does it make sense to you? You know, somebody may think that, oh, uh, somebody who is a pagan worshiper, if you became a Catholic, that that is a, is a better step. But it's not true. Becoming a Catholic is worse off because the seat of Satan is in Catholicism. It's not even in the um, idol temple. It's not even there. It's in Catholicism. That's where the seat of Satan is. So if, it, if, 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 um, if an idol worshiper becomes a Catholic, he's even a worse idol worshiper in Catholicism. He's a worse idol worshiper because they worship idols that have been given Christian names. They, they partake in, in a pagan feast that have been given Christian titles. Like Christmas and Easter. They are pagan feasts. Is that right? The Christmas is a celebration of the sun god. The Easter is a celebration of the moon god. Ashtoreth. Huh? We saw that when we did the study on the house of Vigo. You remember? When we look at the zodiac from the house of Vigo we saw that um, Christmas was about the worship of um, Nimrod, 
the son of Nimrod, is that right? Uh, which was Talmud. And then we saw um, Ashtoreth, which was actually Semiramis. Huh? And so that was what was celebrated as Easter. You know, the Easter celebration has been taking place before Jesus was killed. Huh? It's been taking place long before Jesus was killed. If you remember in your Bible, when Herod was to take one of the disciples, the Bible said it was close to the celebration of Easter. So Easter celebration was a old Roman paganic festival. Are you listening? That have now been Christianized. <laughs> so anybody who is an idol worshiper that becomes a Catholic has even fallen from fry pan into the fire. So we saw that many people were being killed because they refused to convert from idol worship into Catholicism. People were being killed because they refused to convert from Judaism into Catholicism. And then you can see that those Jews that were killed were the ones we saw under the fifth seal. Is that right? He said, and when he opened the fifth sea, I saw souls under the altar. One thing you will notice is that the first four seals, they were being announced. That is, the, the, the activities of Satan was announced by a beast. When the first sea was opened, a beast announced it. He said, I saw one of the beasts say, come and see. When the second was opened, the same thing. The third was opened. The same thing, a beast announced. The fourth was open, a beast announced. That was showing to us that it was the, the, the anointing. Brother so those beasts were not Tyrions. They were not, um, um, they were actually living creatures. They were not beasts that would scare you. You know, when you hear of a beast, a beast is something that comes to afflict. But these were not those kind of beasts. The actual interpretation was living creatures. And so there were anointings that God released on his bride to cushion the effect of the antics of the enemy. He said, when the enemy shall come as a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against it. Now, one thing that we noticed was that when the fifth seal was opened, no beast announced it. Is that right? No beast announced the activities of what was happening in the fifth seal. If you will notice... There were no horse riders after the fourth seal. No horse riders. The first, second, third, and fourth, we saw horse riders. But in the fifth seal, there were no horse riders. And so because there were no horse riders, there were no beasts to announce anything. It then means that what we saw under the fifth, the sixth seal, were events that were already taking place. Does it make sense to you? So now, what flood came that the Spirit of the Lord raised up a standard against in the fifth, in the sixth, and in the seventh? The floodings were already there in the first four seals. So like I told you, what Satan was doing to the bride, that is the red horse rider, was the same thing that affected the Jews that became captured underneath the fifth seal. Are you, are you, is, is that clear to you? I'm trying to make you understand because when we came to fifth and the sixth and the seventh, there were no horse riders and therefore there were no beasts to announce anything. So the activities of Satan was already taking place in the first four seals. That is why if you notice, he said in verse 9 of Revelation 6, And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain. Who slew them? Where was the horse riders that slew them? These were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So they were slain by the activities of the horse riders that took place under the first, second, 
third and fourth seal. Is that right? That's how they were slain. So we now saw that the fifth seal was showing to us that these sets of people, even though they were not members of the bride, they had the seed of God. Even though they were not members of the bride. The Jews that we saw crying for vengeance, the reason they are crying for vengeance is because they are not yet born again. If they were born again, Brother Bram said they would have been like Stephen, crying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what, they, what they've done. But they were crying for what? Vengeance. Meaning that they were not born again, meaning that they were not members of the bride of Christ. But they were slain by the activities of the horse riders. Is that clear to us? So you would see that as long as a Jew was slain in this age or in any of this age, because of the word of God, because they remain in Judaism, as long as they were slain, they were underneath. It was something that was that the fifth seed captured. So you're not going to have a separate age for the fifth seal. Because you could see now that all the seven ages, the seven church ages, we have divided it, divided it into, the fourth, into the four seals. First seal, second, third, and fourth. So which age are we going to have fifth seal? But you cannot see that as these horse riders were affecting the bride of Christ, they also affected the Jews. So because of their effect on the Jews, we now have a seal that is separate, that has nothing to do with the bride of Christ. Is that clear? That's how we, we have the fifth seal. So please put up the slide. Okay, if you can just um, make that area more, if you can zoom that area, please. Okay, so we have um, please bear with me. Okay, so we have here the seed age, which we said is the age that was existing before the seven church ages began. And so we said that this was the age of the fathers, and so we call it the Alpha Bride Age. At this time, there were no seals. Do we understand this? That there were no seals during the Alpha Age. We call it the Alpha Bride Age is the foundation of the pyramid that pyramid that that's the alpha bright age is the foundation and paul was the chief first apostle in that age he was not the messenger of that age that age had no human messenger is that right they had no human messenger paul only became messenger during the efficient church age most people, most preachers within the message, when they want to talk about this period, they group it under the efficient church age. 
but they failed to understand that before the, the ages actually began in 53 AD. And of course, we know the day of Pentecost was 33 AD. So we have a 20 year period before the seven church ages began. So it was a perfect age. Only the Lord God was adding to the church daily those who should be saved. Now we now see that when the entrance uh, of the Antichrist spirit came in, we now begin to have the church ages. And so I kind of divided each of the ages. You know, efficient church age ended in 170 AD. The Smyrna church age ended in 312 AD. And the Pergamon church age ended in 606 AD. So we have one, two, three. The first, um, the first three ages. So I have this heading. I call it the seed growth. So here I said the fall of the seed. And, and we saw the quote of the prophet where Brother Bram said, in that first church age, the bride was already a falling woman. So I call it the fall of the seed. Now the seed continued to fall in this minor church age. And then in the Pergamon church age, that seed died. It went into the, the, the ground. At the end of that age, it, it went into the ground. So we can call it the death of the seed. But in the Tartarian church age was when that seed actually got rotten. Is that right? Now, if you can take the slide this way, let me... So we see that for these first three church ages, we have the first seal. This is the first seal. And in this seal, Satan came as a flood using the white horse rider. And then the response of God or the standard that God raised was the face of a lion. That was the anointing. So since Satan came with false teachings, God came with the true teaching. But Abraham said that's why he raised men like Paul. That's why he raised Irenus. That's why he raised Martin. That's why he raised Polycar. Is that right? These were teachers to combat the false teachings that Satan came with. And of course, we know that the white horse was... A rider, we saw a rider on the white horse, he had a bow and no arrow. Is that right? A bow and no arrow, and he received a crown later. So he started as a spirit, and then he progressed to become what? A man. So what began as a spirit became a man, which we call the Pope. So it was when we had a Pope, when that Pope was crown, that's what the scripture said, he was not given a crown. But when it started, it started as a spirit. And of course, we saw that he said he went forth to conquer and to conquer. Is that right? That was Nico Latinism, which was conquering the laity. Does it make sense to you? Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. I want you to see um, the first seal inside these ages. Revelation chapter 2. Now, He said, unto the angel of the church of Ephesus. So we said we could read this, that unto um, Apostle Paul, write, this thing seeth he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks. So Jesus is introduced in, in a facet of his glory. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. So we see in the bride members that they had many qualities that you could find in a perfect age. Because they were falling from a perfect age. So they knew how to try the ministers. Still had that orientation. They still had that training. 
that when people came with um, preaching, you don't just believe them. You've got to try them. You've got to give them the word test so they still knew that. Because you will find that, that after some time, the members of the bride lost that understanding. They couldn't design or that spirit of discernment was not there to know those who were false teachers. But at this early period of the fall of God's bride, they still had those characters and God commended them. He said, you, you try them. We say they are apostles and are not and you found them liars. <laughs> you know, just in a, you know, this was kind of trying all ministers, but something that came to my mind is today we have a lot of people claiming to be apostles. Uh, I think yesterday I saw on Facebook one little guy that rose up and is always uh, shouting uh, all over street corners saying he's preaching as a message uh, preacher. And recently he now put a title that's an apostle. So somebody say, are you not an apostle? <laughs> he said, pray for me. <laughs> because somebody was surprised. Are you now an apostle? Just a young guy, I, I don't know his church, but he's always posting his videos on Facebook where he stays in one street corner preaching to like three or four people saying he's doing crusade. And then he, had a, he has a friend, that one says he's a prophet. And I don't know how they just give themselves titles. When you say you're a prophet, do you have the ability to... To, to be awake huh? and see things. You had that ability since you were young or you are a prophet like all these ones that bait people's wife by the river shore. What kind of a prophet are you? But everybody calls themselves name and because every, no, there's no vetting system within the message so everybody can claim to be anything they like. Is that right? They can just claim to be anything they like. So I just saw this. He said, you have tried them. We say they are apostles. If you recall, we did a teaching and we said that what sets apart an apostle is his ability to set up churches. They've got the stamina. They can go into a locality where they are not, they are not known. They've got no comfort. But they have the stamina to stay there and weather the storm. They can raise up churches in a, in a terrain that they are not conven, uh, conversant with. And they will excel. That's what marks an apostle. But he said, you have tried them, we say they are apostles. Now we can use this in a generic term. Those who say they are preachers. Because you know that a lot of the called ones, they were drafted into the office of apostles early in that um, um, uh, alpha bright age a lot of the ministers were drafted into the office of apostles so even prophets were taken into the office of apostles evangelists were taken into the office of apostles the reason was because god that was the foundation of god's bride so we would have a lot of churches being formed so we had john that was a prophet he was drafted into the office of apostle a lot of them that even Paul was a prophet from birth, he was drafted into the office of an apostle because of the unique responsibility the church was being founded and established and therefore churches will need to be what? Raised. And so you will have one apostle that is overseeing a lot of churches. Does it make sense to you? Now, he said... You found them liars. He said, and thou, and you have burned, and you have patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. He said, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Of course, the first love symbolizes the kind of relationship that exists between newly wedded fellows. Is that right? The bride was engaged to Christ, because she came out of Christ. There was no need for courtship. You know, somebody said one time that the seven church ages was a period of courtship between Christ and his bride. There was no courtship between Jesus and his bride. The same way there were no courtship between Adam and Eve. Huh? Immediately Adam saw Eve. He said, this is flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She will be called woman because she was taken out of me. 
So Adam immediately identified Eve as his eternal mate in glory. When you have discovered that a sister is your eternal mate in glory, as a sister, you've discovered that a brother is your eternal mate in glory. Courtship has ended. That's the end of courtship. You engage because you have now... The, the, the reason why you have to do courtship is because you want to know if this lady or if this brother is your eternal mate in glory. That's the reason for courtship. You are studying each other. So Adam did not need to study Eve. He knew who Eve was. That Eve came out of him. So when he pronounced that word, that word is, the, is, is, is engagement. You are flesh of my flesh. You are bone of my bone. That is engagement. So when the bride was formed on the day of Pentecost, she was already engaged. Of course, we saw in the resume of the ages, Brother Bram said the wedding should have taken place. So if wedding should have taken place, how can you not say at the suspension of the wedding, they will not do courtship? Huh? If we have decided to wed, are we going to go back to courtship? Maybe because there's, there's cause for delay of the ceremony? If there is a reason why the ceremony has to be delayed, do we not go back to courtship? No, we are already what? Engaged. So the bride of Christ was already engaged by predestination. She came from God. Brother Abraham says she was perfect. Is that right? So she already came from, from God. So there was no need for what? Courtship. In fact, it would interest you to know that Jesus already paid the bride price. Before, before I mean, he already paid the bride price. You know the cup of wine you normally would give the husband to drink in a wedding ceremony. I'm um, sorry, in, the, in your traditional wedding now. Huh? You know, the, 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 the bride will bring a cup of wine for the groom to drink. It was that cup that Jesus said, if it's possible, let this cup pass over me. All of those things you see Jesus doing from the Garden of Gethsemane were all wedding rites. If it's possible, let this cup pass from me. And then, he now paid the supreme price, which was to lay down his life. Then you are talking about courtship. Again. What courtship? <laughs> because even the prophet told us that when Jesus was here on earth, that the bride was inside Jesus. He said the bride of Christ was inside Jesus. So he already paid the price. So he now, he now gave birth to that bride that was inside him on the day of Pentecost. And when the bride was giving birth, he declared that she was pure, undefiled, and was to now do the main ceremony. Is that right? But just at, at the time for when everything was to be consummated, the antichrist, the antichrist spirit came in. And so when the antichrist spirit came in, there was no need for what? Redemption of that bride. So the entire seven church ages was to redeem the bride back to her perfect condition. So that the marriage that was suspended could what? Continue. Now, it said, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. Remember and repent. This is all speaking of redemption. And do, the, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You ate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Now we're talking about the efficient age. Huh? He said they ate the deed of the Nicolaitans. And the prophet said Nicolaitans is from two words. Nico and Leite. Is that right? Which means conquer. It means to conquer the Leite. The Leite speaks of the congregation. Huh? To conquer the Leite. What this means is that during the Alpha Age, there was no difference between laity and the clergy. Are you with me? There was no difference. Paul said, 
the people glorify God in me. They glorify God in me. Not that they glorify God and me. Are you listening? Because when you have a separation of the laity and the clergy, it now means that the clergy seeks to place themselves higher in terms of anointing, in terms of connection to God and all that, or spirituality. That they have a higher level of spirituality than the people. So that was what we began to see, a separation of the laity from the clergy. The clergy began to assume a higher position than the scripture affords them. So they began to want to be glorified. And we're seeing the same thing today among the Pentecostals. Wherein they tell you that um, your pastor is the one that has to impart grace on you. Your pastor is the one that has to intercede for you. He has to fight for you. And all that. This was not what was taking place during the Alpha Age. The Alpha Age, they were all together. They just knew that this one was gifted to preach. It doesn't mean that he's uh, to assume a higher authority over us. Or it doesn't mean that he's supposed to be between us and God. Huh? That, oh, the minister is the one that can intercede for you, the laity. The clergy has to not stay in a position between the people and God. So what we began to see, this is God. The way it was before was clergy plus laity. Huh? That's the way it was before. But when the deeds of the Nicolaitanism began to come in, that was the white horse rider riding to conquer and to conquer. So it was to conquer the laity. That was the white horse rider. So it was to conquer the laity, conquer the laity. So he started from a spirit until he became a man and was crowned. So what we had was that it was now, instead of God directly lording over the clergy plus the laity, we now had a situation whereby we had God. The clergy now came in between God and the laity. So that if God were to speak, it will, it will speak first to laity. If God is to relate, is to relate with, with sorry, relate with clergy before the laity can see anything from God. So what it meant was that if any one of the laity was to have anything to do with God, it was to pass through the clergy. This is what we call the deeds of the Nicolaitanism that began to creep amongst the bride. Before, God was lording over his people directly, not through an intermediary. So this, this is an example of what you call the deeds of the Nicolaitanism. Of the, Nicola, the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also ate. So we had early in this age, the members of the bride who fight it. They tried the ministers and they found many of them to be liars. But as time progressed, that spirit began to have a strong hold over the people so that we began to see this set up within the members of the bride. This was not just what was evident amongst the false vine. Even amongst the true vine, we began to see this kind of setup. And what we're trying to say is that what you can see evidently the first seal. Huh? Nicolaitans to conquer the laity. And the white horse rider went forth conquering and to conquer. Do you see that? Now let's go to the resume of the ages or the resume of the ages. Or first, we go to the efficient church age. I just want to explain this a little. The efficient church age. So what you're going to find that is that in this age, we have Nicolaitans 
when we got to Pegamine, it became what? Palamism. We're going to see that. So here it started with Nicolaitans. It now grew to what? Balamism. So it was under Balamism that this spirit became as a man. So if you see the progression amongst this clergy, when it was getting to around this pagan church age, we began to see something amongst the clergy themselves. Are you seeing something? Amongst the clergy themselves, we began to see something. Amongst them, we began to have hierarchy. Amongst the clergy. Notice the way it started. We now have a situation like this. Instead of God lording over clergy and laity as it's supposed to be, we now have clergy serving as an intermediary between God and the laity. Now, I'm not saying that amongst this clergy, you began to have hierarchy amongst them. So, what we now had, we had priest. From priest, we have uh, bishop. From bishop, we have cardinals. We now have pope. This was now hierarchy amongst the clergy. So, it, it was building from priest on and on and on until we now have one man which was the what pope that was when he now received his crown in the pergamine age sisters are you getting what we're saying huh look at the way it started in the alpha age god above the clergy and the lady together there was no supposed to be any separation between clergy and lady. The way it is now, even in our church now, there is no separation between me and you. No separation. That is why I've told you, you don't need to come and meet me to anoint you. <laughs> if you feel you need to do that, this spirit is inside you. That's why you feel the need. Some people want a man to be their cover because they are afflicted with this spirit. They want somebody to be their, their cover. Then, when we go to Balamism, you will now see that among the preachers, they want somebody that they will report to. So first, we are seeing a, 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 a control, a conquering of the preachers over the people. In our grew to, among the preacher, one preacher is conquered by another preacher. For example, Balaam was reporting to Balak instead of reporting to God. Moses was not reporting to no man. Moses was reporting directly to God. Balaam was reporting to Balak. That was among the clergy you now have this kind of a system. That's why Brother Bram said, we find organization under Nicolaitans. He said, why well, we find denominationalism inside Balaamism. Can you now see why even among message folks, we may not have this like this, but we have this, we have Balamism. Denominationalism is still among because it's a spirit. You can come out of organization, but you may not have come out of denomination. It may still be well inside you. It may be well inside you. And Brother Brown said, when a people adopt Nicolaitanism and Balamism, and you have political and financial power behind it. He said the next thing that will happen is that they will go into Jezebelism. And it is in this age that we have Jezebelism in the Tartarian church age. So you can see Nicolaitanism started here, grew, and then became Balamism here. Do you understand the difference now? This one, the preacher, is just over the people. Where you have Balamism is when that preacher himself is controlled by another man. A preacher wants to preach in his church, he wants to shake what that what a what a higher prophet believes. He said, How do you see this doctrine? <laughs> huh? How do you see this doctrine? That's denominationalism, huh? That's why you find out that any redeemed preacher here cannot preach his own understanding. He must shake with that huh? <laughs> 
even if he slept and had a, a, a revelation, if Gio, Daddy Gio does not see that, he may be right. And Daddy Gio may be wrong. But he cannot preach his own thinking or his own revelation. He must be in line with creed and the dogmas. He must be in line with it. If he tries to do otherwise, he will be kicked out. Even we saw it here. We have, I don't want to call names. Was it Eta Eta group? You can't preach what you like. You must con consult with him. The late pastor, Eta. And that's why you find somebody will have six or seven churches. He just put Dickens to be running the church. Huh? Any day comes into town, he come and preach and carry tight. I, I, are, you, are, you, are you seeing something? You find somebody, he says, pastor of, of, of 10 churches. He will spend one month here. Next month, he will go to the other church. Spend one month. The next month, go to the other church. That's how he will be moving. That's Balamism. Then what they do, they don't allow independent preachers to rise. Any area where they have independent preacher, if he rises and start, he wants to uh, put his own independence, they will push him out. They will push him out. He must follow the dictates of, of Balak. <laughs> you know, Balak is like Constantine. He doesn't know anything. <laughs> he soon is to write. May the Lord help us. Look at the Anglican Church. Do you know the person who wrote their creed and dogmas? Anglican Church. Was King Gary. Have you know King Gary? Of the Tudor dynasty. He was not a Christian. He was an adulterer. In fact, the reason why he created the Anglican Church was because the Catholic Church refused to approve his divorce from Queen Catherine of Spain. Because he wanted to marry the young Anne Boleyn. Because the Catholic Church refused, he now came to a thought one day. He said, who is this Pope? I am King of England. King of Great Britain. And sometimes they tell you of France at that time because they felt that France should be under them. Who is that foreign king called a Pope that will tell me what to do? So you mean my churches, the bishop of the Catholic Church in my nations, are headed by another king? But Abraham said for the very first time, because scripture said the wrath of man does not praise God. But Abraham said, but in this place, we see the wrath of man praising God. Because when King Eric became angry at that, he now decided to pull away, pull the Catholic Church in England from the mother Catholic Church in Rome and called that one Anglican Church. And he now became the head of that church, not the Pope. Sometimes he will be drunk, he will be writing creed and dogmas for them. He'll be writing creed. And that's how they got their creed. That's why till this day, the Archbishop of Canterbury is appointed by the monarchy. It's the monarchy of Great Britain that approves who should be Archbishop of Canterbury. So it means that the monarchy is Balak. The bishop is Balaam. <laughs> the way Constantine was Balak and whoever was Pope was, was Balaam. Is it clear? So you can see it clearly in this age. Now let's get to the efficient church age. Brother Bram said, But Abraham said, This is not true, for whatever starts in the early church must continue in every age. So we can see those same things now because they started then, so they must continue in every age until it is finally blessed 
and exalted by God or destroyed as an unclean thing in the lake of fire. That this tradition is actually a that this tradition is actually against scripture, simply note that in Revelation 2 verse 2, the efficient church could not bear the evil ones. Hope you know the difference. Paul's letter to the Ephesians, the book of Ephesus, and the Spirit's message to the efficient church age. Do we know the difference? I'm asking before we go on. Paul wrote an epistle to the Ephesians. So you have the book of Ephesus. Huh? The book of Ephesians, right? In your Bible. Then we now have in Revelation 2 verse 1, the Spirit giving a message to the church at Ephesus. You know the difference? Paul's own was writing to the Lytra church in Ephesus. Why the Spirit's message is not to the Lytra church in Ephesus? The Spirit's message is to an entire age, the entire Gentile age, from 53 AD to 170 AD. Is it clear? So when you read Revelation 2 verse 1, the Spirit of God is speaking to an entire Gentile age called the Ephesian church age. Paul's epistle to the church at Ephesus is an epistle to a literal church that he formed in the city of Ephesus. Does it make sense? So he was writing to them as their apostle because he formed that church. Then the, the spirit spoke to Paul as the messenger to the entire Gentile world for a period of from 53 AD to what? 170 AD. Is it clear? Is it clear? So you must know the difference between the efficient church age and the church at what? Ephesus. So now it says the efficient church could not bear the evil ones. We've, we've read that. He said they thus had to put them out or it would not make sense to say they could not bear them. You can't say you do not bear someone and you keep the person. You can't say when you get away this pastor they preach and you still stay there. But the Brown said when the minister leave the world, you leave the man. Pastors don't like to, they love to say, oh, follow, stay with your pastor, we'll lead you through. If your pastor does not have the word, you leave him. There is nothing like, oh, he was nice to me. It may be that that niceness was why God brought him across your path. When you've received the nice um, feelings, leave him. God will pay him. You don't need to be the one to pay him. Are you with me? God will pay him. Some people are staying in, in, in a church because they feel they owe the pastor loyalty. They feel they owe him something because he's done so much for them. That's not the reason why we stay in a church. We stay, if the man doesn't have the word, we leave him. If one day you see that I don't have the word, you can leave. Run for your, your, for your dear life. Because if you stay, you will go to hell. I will take you with me to hell. <laughs> yes, because if I've left the word, it means I'm going to hell. That's what it means. It means that I've all, I've all, maybe I've, I've, I've preached wonderfully before, but I was only a 99% believer. Because you could believe 99%, but the day that 1% you don't believe finds you. Everything you believe, you will leave it. And so those who are of God must be careful to wash you. This man, though they leave the world, though, he thought they allow some Jehovah's Witness doctrine to come in. They should be able to spot him. And once they discover that, run for your life. No matter how nice the preacher is. Wrong. Wrong. He said, they, he said now, if they did not put them out, then they were bearing them. Now, in verse 6, it says that they hated their deeds. So this Nicolaitan group remained a part of the first age, doing their deeds. Grievous wolves in sheep clothing. And they kept coming up with false doctrines, false doctrines, false doctrines. Before long, the people lost the truth about the Godhead. They began to baptize in Titus because of these Nicolaitans. And the reason this was so was because they were able to show that we the preachers know better than you. So, 
the members were able to resist them up to a point. But you know, Satan was coming with a full force. Before long, the people became weak. And they began to respect their precious beyond measure. Paul said that you glorify God in me. The precious are to lift God up. So that the people will glorify God, not the precious. Because when you begin to glorify a preacher, you will not know when it goes into error. You will not know. But when you, you see God, because that's what the preacher is elevating, then you glorify God, not the preacher. Paul said you glorify God in me. You didn't glorify God and me. That's what it becomes a problem. Now he said, he said, he said their deeds were hated, but the people were not rendered impotent. So these, these Nicolaitans remained. They were still there. He said, thus we see seeds in Ephesus that we continue and we become a doctrine that we go right up to and into the lake of fire. Who are these Nicolaitans? The word comes from two, two Greek words. Nikao, which means to conquer, and Laos which means the laity. In plain fact, somebody was doing something in that early church which was conquering the laity. If the laity were being conquered, then it must have been some authority that was doing it. What was it that God ate that was happening in that church? What was going on then, and it's now going on today, is exactly what the word Nicolaitan means. The people were being subjected somehow in a way that was absolutely contrary to the word of God. Now to get the real meaning of what we are about to go into, I must caution you to ever keep in mind that religion, spiritual matters if you like, is composed of two parts. That it's in wine but are so opposite as black and white. Religion and the spiritual world are made of those two trees that had their roots in Eden. How many of you have the church age book? How many of you have it? Don't be shy. You have it in your house. It's a Gladys, are you sure you have it? And you are reading it. Okay, those who don't have, see me after the service. Not those who are family. Who, if, your, if your family has, don't come. <laughs> Those who do not have access to it comes. You must have that book. You must have that book. Now it says, these two trees stood in the midst of the garden and, 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 and no doubt they are very branches. It and wine each other. Huh? The branches of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were interwined. So that's where you can find tars among wheat. Huh? You can find godly uh, ungodly people amongst godly people because they are interwined. He said, Thus, in the efficient church is that same paradox. The church is made up of good and bad. Two vines make the church. They are like the wheat and the tars growing up side by side. But one is the true, the other is the false. Now, God will speak to each one and He will talk about each one. He will call them the church, and only the elect will really know which is the true spirit. Only, now, only the elect will not be deceived. Matthew 24, 24. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall chew great signs and wonders in so much that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So way back there in the early church, a very short period after Pentecost. Can you see what they're saying again? A very short period after Pentecost, the first vine got to interwine itself. So what it means is that during the Alpha Age, there was no interwining. He said a short period after Pentecost was when the interwining took place. It didn't happen immediately at Pentecost because we had that 20-year period of perfection. So in 53 AD, interwining took place. That's what Brother Bram is saying. He said a very short while. Now, he said, the first vine got to intertwine itself among the true vine, and we find these deeds of the Nicolaitans. And that spirit is going to be found fighting the true vine until it is destroyed by God. It means that same interwining takes place till today. 
All right. Now, what was the spiritual climate of that church? It had left its first love. Leaving its first love of the word of God was revealed to us as having fallen from its origin, which was Pentecost. In plain English, that means this church was in danger of being taken away from the leading of the Holy Spirit, the control of the Spirit. This was exactly what took place after Moses led Israel out of Egypt. The way of God was to lead them by the cloud of fire, prophetic utterance, miracles and signs, and God-given wonders. This was to be accomplished by God-selected and God-ordained and God-equipped and God-sent men with the old camp being dominated by a Holy Ghost move. They rebelled and wanted a set of rules and creeds to go by. Then they wanted a king. Then they wanted to be exactly like the world and went into complete apostasy and oblivion. This was exactly how the first church age started and it will get worse and worse until the Holy Spirit is completely rejected and God must destroy the people. See how it started out in the early church. It was called deeds. Then it became what? A doctrine. It became the standard. It became the unbending way. Unbending way means that nobody knows anything differently. Huh? As in unbending means you cannot, um, you cannot straight it again. It's unbending. You can't do anything again. It started, when it started as a deed, they could have done something. It became what? A doctrine. Maybe they could have done something. Before long, it became what? A standard. And when it became unbending, there was nothing they could do again. It finally took over and God was pushed aside. Oh, it started so small, so quietly, so inoffensively. It looked so good. It seemed so sound. Then it caught a hold. And like a python, it squeezed out the very breath and killed all the spirituality there was in the church. Oh, that first vine is subtle. It's like an angel of light until it gets a hold on you. Now, I want to say that I believe in leadership. I went with this. But it is not the leadership of men I believe in. Because leadership of men is what? Nicolaitanism. I believe in the leadership of the Holy Ghost coming through the word. I believe also that God has set men in the church, men who are gifted by the Spirit, and they will keep the church in order. I believe that. I believe also that the church is ruled over by men that God sends to take charge. But that rule is by the word. So that it is not men really ruling, but the Spirit of God. For the word and the Spirit are one. Hebrews 13, 7, remember them which have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that has come forth. We appreciate you, Lord, for insight. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of these things, because we can see them still happening in this day. And if we're not careful, Lord, Satan is ever subtle and can accomplish greater, greater damage than before. Because now all hell has been released. But thankfully, Lord, you've released all revelation to combat the antics of the devil. And Lord, we want to get ourselves united with that revelation. No man in between. We want to be united directly with you. We go directly to take the book out of the right hand of him that came down from glory. We don't go to a preacher to, to take the book he took from the angel. We go directly to the angel. And that's the way, Lord, you want it to be. And Lord, we are walking in that strength and committing the rest of the service into your hands. Have your way, blessed Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.